Welcome to Pretty Lies and Alibis. Let's seek the truth and travel the long road to justice together. What you know, alibiers, welcome to another episode of Pretty Lies and Alibis. I'm Gigi. It's Thursday, almost to the end of the week. I'm looking forward to the weekend. I'm having a new deck built on my house. That deck was 15 years old and it caved in in the middle. And I sort of put it off because it's the South. It's summer. It's hot, right? We don't go out there except to grill. But once that part fell out, other parts of the deck were like, yeah, we're checking out too. So my poor dogs are kind of having to dodge the holes in the deck. So it's time. I'm going to have it screened in because I think we'll enjoy that space a little more here in the hot south with mosquitoes as big as your hand. Big thank you to everybody who donated, bought merch. Also, huge thank you to Felicia and Harry for your very thoughtful gifts. Appreciate you guys. If you haven't hit subscribe yet, hit that subscribe button, like this video, and hit the little bell if you want notifications when I upload new content. Music fact of the day, Peter Cetera. His signature vocal style was a result of being punched in the face and breaking his jaw in three places. His jaw was wired shut for months and he learned to talk without opening his mouth and use that tactic while singing. During this time, he also started writing songs and while his jaw was wired shut, he wrote two of Chicago's many hits, those being Baby What a Big Surprise and If You Leave Me Now, which is a great song. I love their greatest hits album. It's really good. I think I'll play it later when I wake up from a really long nap because your girl didn't sleep a wink last night. Zero. Nothing was wrong. I felt fine. Just didn't come together. And it's so frustrating. So I eventually got up, got ready, did court TV this morning at 830. I'm going to get this out so I can go lay down. I'm not even going to fight it. I'm not going to go into the details of what happened with the molestation at the hands of Josh Duggar. It's not my story to tell. These survivors clearly have a lot on their plate in dealing with these attacks. All these years later, it's very evident on Jill's face in this documentary and with the things she says. I think what we learned in the documentary was not even the half of it. I I'm sure this escalated far beyond what was talked about in this documentary and it was bad enough as you could imagine i do think jill is super super brave and i think she has a really good support system in her husband derek she has removed herself from these teachings and has spoken up about being a victim and in fact there were some court documents that were unsealed from 2017 that showed jill duggar accused her dad jim bob of verbal abuse in the filing jill says I saw a whole new side to my dad once my husband and I started making decisions that were best for our family, but not in his best interest. Sadly, I realized he had become pretty controlling, fearful, and reactionary. He was verbally abusive. Our relationship is not good. It got pretty toxic. And it's interesting if you think about this, he's mad at Jill because she got a nose ring, had drank alcohol, and was wearing pants. However, he didn't seem to get mad at his son when his son molested four of his sisters, and a babysitter. It just goes to show you the backwards teaching of this patriarchal system within this cult. Of course, come down hard on the girls, but Josh, we're just going to send you to do some woodwork at Bill Gothard's facility for troubled boys. And as we know, they never got these survivors the help they needed to process the very traumatic events at the hands of their brother. So they are the biggest enablers of all. And shame on them for being hypocrites because to get up on a stage in a church full of people or in their book or more importantly on their reality show, which was a huge, huge hit, to say that children are a blessing from God and not protect those children once they're born, you are a bad parent. You are a terrible parent. I don't care how many kids you've had, you're enabling abuse. They did this for very selfish reasons. They swept it under the rug because that's what this institute teaches is number one, a lot of victim shaming and blaming. We went over that in the last episode as to Bill Gothard's reasoning as to why this would happen to an innocent person. She goes on to say that she will occasionally text on a family group thread she also says she does not feel comfortable being around her father in a casual setting saying it isn't good for my mental health right now. The document also say that her and her husband, Derek, who I think is amazing for her, he got his law degree. I just found that out last night and I think they've moved to Oklahoma. They're very removed from it, but they were asked to never come over to Jim Bob and Michelle's house 
unless they had permission from one of them directly. And it's also mentioned that Jim Bob failed to give the sisters who were victims of Josh's molestation adequate therapy. It also says, unlike most who claim to have been sexually assaulted, the plaintiffs in this case were forced to live with their alleged assailant for years after their respective assaults. The plaintiffs were also not provided treatment or at least adequate treatment. None of them can even recall the name of the counselor they vaguely recall talking to once as a group and with their mother and father in attendance to deal with the trauma of the assault. No real measures were taken by their parents to ensure their safety during the remainder of their adolescence. And it's it's very true. And I think a lot of that was driven by the fact that Jim Bob saw this show on TLC as a worldwide platform recruiting tool for Bill Gothard's teaching. Also, I think that Jim Bob made eight or nine million dollars throughout the run of this whole series and never shared that with his kids. He had a lot of reasons for sweeping this under the rug, but it's not just those two things. It seems to be the general practice in this cult as a whole to victim blame and have the Institute deal with it instead of the authorities and licensed professionals for mental health treatment because that brings the world into your home when they want all of this to be very contained. And what a, what a pity for these survivors. Michelle Duggar, just as a reminder of how they enabled Josh and continued to enable him, even after he was found guilty of having some of the worst child sex abuse materials that federal investigators have ever had to look at, she writes a letter in support of Josh to the judge. And she said that she wanted to share some things about Joshua's character that may not be fully known to the court. She said she hopes a fair and just sentence is determined. She says, Josh has a tender heart and he is compassionate towards others. If someone is having a difficult time, he's the first one to encourage or try to help them in a tangible way. He and his wife and children have helped many others by doing cleaning and repair projects and lending a help in hand. Joshua has always been a positive and upbeat person. He is wise financially, not going into debt. He is a good provider for his family, working diligently and thinking of creative ways to support and take care of his wife and children. He's also generous and shares his resources with others in need. She said he's an organized and diligent individual who has set a good example of applying himself eagerly to work and in his many other responsibilities that he carries as a husband and a father. In commenting about family life with his wife, Anna, and their seven kids, Michelle said to the judge they have built forts, learned how to work on bicycles and other vehicles, gone camping, hiked, fished, and played countless games and sports. Together. And she puts an exclamation point. That's all well and good, but the man's still a predator. He can take his family camping all he wants. Still a pervert. Still deserves Every day of the 12-year sentence he got, plus the two months he got for having an illegal cell phone. She requested that Josh be reunited with his wife and family in a timely manner. And signed, <laughs> she signed it, y'all, dotting the I in Michelle with a heart, like we did in fifth grade. His wife, Anna, also wrote the judge saying Joshua sees the best in people and is willing to walk alongside them to help make their dreams a reality. The happiest part of the day by far is when daddy comes home from work and his cheerful voice fills the house. My children and I rely on Joshua for financial, emotional, and physical support. He is an engaged dad who, is, who gladly throws a football with his sons, listens to our daughters play a new song that they've learned on the piano, and helps answer homework questions or lends a hand sweeping up spilled crackers. He is a kind, loving, supporting, and caring father and husband, his primary focus in life. Lord have mercy, y'all. Uh, you know, a lot of people have asked why Anna hasn't left, and I really never understood it until watching this documentary. She is fearful. They are told terrible things will happen if they divorce, and it is a fear-based religion, especially for women and children. Nicole Barres is a neighbor of Josh's and wrote about Josh's financial support of a widow and says she's met people to whom he has given cars in an effort to assist them financially. He attentively listens to people's hurts and struggles and attempts to resolve them. She then goes on to talk about Josh bringing her medicine during the pandemic when she was pregnant but had COVID. So this episode one starts out with Jill and Derek getting situated on the couch for the interview. 
The person off camera says it makes perfect sense that sitting here today would be too much and ask what changed and made her want to do this interview. She said there's a lot and she didn't know if she wanted to open this can of worms, but she said there's a lot of families, but theirs was on TV. She said Jim Bob grew up in a poor family and Jill thinks that made him grow up quickly. Jim Bob has heard in audio saying that growing up his family would have their electricity cut off. They would have their house foreclosed on. He said his dad did not have his spiritual focus in line and that caused problems for his family when he was a child. Then they go into the TLC series. There's clips of meets and greets with the Duggars. Cousin Amy and her husband, Dylan King, are interviewed. And Cousin Amy said the show, obviously, as we know, became a phenomenon quickly. And everybody knew who the family was when they went out places. She asked Jim Bob, since he didn't believe in owning a TV, why would they do the show? And he told Amy this was a ministry. They were a part of the movement called the Institute in Basic Life Principles, which was founded by Bill Gothard. Bill Gothard's father was a minister and also the head of the Gideons Association. Those are the Bibles in the hotel rooms. A little tip, if you flip through those when you get in a hotel room, I have found cash in them, just saying. I think they're rewarding people for opening them, so give it a little flip through, you might find a surprise. Gothard is really a product of an evangelical dynasty. He went to Wheaton College, which is the fundamentalist school. And fun fundamentalists are people who have a strict and literal interpretation of a religious text or set of beliefs. They don't see there's any leeway for interpretation. What is written is the word, and that's it. We know in 1961, yesterday, we talked about him starting the local workshops on how to parent and how to discipline in spite of the fact the man never had a wife or a kid. He teaches prosperity gospel, which is to obey God and then God will bless you. They show a really helpful visual of how quickly this spread and how their numbers got to be so big. These local community workshops were taken into all the different churches that the attendees were members of. And that's how they were introduced. And then it just kind of spreads like wildfire. There were way more people in this cult than I thought before I watched this documentary. In 1968, obviously huge times for this country. There was political shifts. There was economic shifts. Social, cultural changes were happening. You had the women's rights movement, student protesters, the civil rights movement was happening. And Christians were starting to wonder, is it okay to have long hair, listen to rock and roll? or watch TV, and Gothard told his followers not to worry about what the right thing to do was because he knew the right thing to do about everything. In 1984, the Advanced Training Institute, or ATI, is formed, and they show a little commercial for it on the documentary, and it says the ATI is biblically centered, parent-supervised, and home-based. This is a homeschooling curriculum that the Institute put out. It was all of Gothard's teachings. It was just turned into curriculum for families and also curriculum for home education. These people wanted to take control of their kids' education, really just take control of every aspect of their life. They were taught that public school's evil and that they should avoid it at all costs. So Bill Gothard uh, jumped on that wave and quite successfully wrote it because these kids were essentially taught to believe that everything this man said was the word. Jill says that while growing up, her parents wanted to protect them from the world. She said the conferences for ATI they went to were fun and exciting. She said it was a community. ATI essentially told families that they were giving them the key that they needed to be good parents and to homeschool the kids and to make sure that your kids turn out right. She said, it's an appealing thing when you see an organization promising all this to you. And on screen, there's a video from a seminar of all these mothers holding infants on the stage. In 1992, they started the Children's Institute of the Seminar and Basic Life Principles. They learn about the authority and the importance of obeying the spoken and unspoken wishes of those who are responsible for us. They show little kids listening to this. Uh, there was one kid in the background. He was so bored. That would have been me in this cult. These families were encouraged to have a lot of kids just for the sole purpose of influencing the world about Jesus Christ. Brooke Arnold is another ex-IBLP person in the documentary, and she said the reason these people have a ton of kids is to populate the army to take over the world. Derek Dillard said it is in the Bible about having a lot of kids, but whoever took it, took it and ran. Jill said, just 
I mean, off the top of her head very quickly as arrows in the hand of a mighty man. So are the children of one's youth. It cuts to a clip of a bunch of kids saying the same thing in unison. Brooke said she was hesitant to do this documentary because she didn't think the Bill Gothard hornet's nest needed to be kicked right now. She said Bill Gothard came into loom over her life almost in a mythical way. And she felt like there was something important that she needed to find out. And the more she understood about Gothard, the more she would understand herself. She said the program Simplicity was really appealing to people who were experiencing chaos in their life. Jim Bob and Jim Holt went to the basic seminar in 1992. Jim Holt is another enabler of Josh Duggar. Their church was busing people to these events and Bill Gothard was the speaker. They show clips from a 1988 seminar, an introduction into the basic seminar. It says Institute in Basic Youth Conflicts. They essentially say that this Institute in Basic Youth Conflicts was born when Bill Gothard was concerned in high school about the many wrong decisions that his classmates were making. The seminar was said to help resolve family conflicts, overcome feelings of inferiority, remove guilt and bitterness, and conquer destructive habits. Bill Gothard is speaking on the screen, asking the packed crowd, do you have a vision for what you could do for the kingdom of the Lord that is worth giving your life for? If you have nothing worth dying for, you have nothing worth living for. When you get to the end of your life, what do you want to be able to look back and say, this is what God accomplished through my life? We have for every one of you the answer on how to conquer any habit you have. And then they start showing these testimonials from members of this cult. A woman says that their lives were falling apart. The kids were rebelling. One man says the Institute saved his life. And then another man said the first night Bill Gothard spoke at one of these events, he just wept. Jim Holt said it was some of the most revolutionary things he had heard out of scripture, how to love God more and how to show him you love him more. He said that's the greatest commandment is to love God with everything you have. And he said it was one of the best things he had heard in his life. He said Jim Bob, along with others, thought Bill Gothard just hung the moon, was the greatest thing to ever walk this earth. They show a clip from a 1998 IBLP seminar with Gothard saying this matter of authority is super important. The seven life principles, these are non-optional basic principles of the Institute. The biggest authority is teaching. He says, we are living in a day in which we have to have equal authority. And sons and daughters want to be equal with their parents. Citizens want to be on an equal level with the government. The whole attitude of our day is equal authority, but God didn't structure your life that way and it doesn't work that way. He said, if you live under the umbrella of protection, Satan can't get through with destructive temptations. We talked about the umbrella yesterday, which is God first the husband or the father, if the woman's not married, then the woman, then the teachings of the church, and then like the kids. At this point, Bill Gothard is selling out stadiums with a seminar. And it's estimated that over, listen to this, y'all, 2 million people have attended these seminars. Jim Holt said a lot of really good people are in the IBLP and they go into it thinking they don't want their kids to get in trouble or go down the wrong path. And they go in thinking that their lives and the lives of their children will be better. They show a clip of Jim Bob speaking from 2009 where he talks about going to the basic seminar when he was in high school. He said it was in 1980, right after he and Michelle got married. Michelle went right after they were married and said that was the best thing to happen to them. So they show an interview with Michelle where she says overpopulation is a myth. Jim Bob says the whole world's population could fit into the city limits of Jacksonville, Florida. They introduce Josh Pease, a minister and a journalist, and notes that at the same time these shows are taking off, there's more and more evidence of abuse within this splinter religion, which are my words, not his, but that's what it is. He said that fathers were turned into cult leaders at, with this Gothard belief system. They cut to a clip of Jim Bob who says God has used this situation with our son Josh to purify their family. Josh Pease said at that time when Christian institutions and authority were slipping, Bill Gothard was bringing in massive crowds to hear him talk. Pease wrote an article for the New Republic about Bill Gothard, IBLP, and the world that they all exist in. The very insular IBLP world. 
not the real one. Bobby Holt and her husband, Jim, are on the documentary. We talked about this couple yesterday. She's the one that just recently filed that order of protection on behalf of herself and her son against Jim and now has a 10-year order of protection against him, which means that she was able to produce proof that abuse had happened in the past or violence and there was a threat of it in the future if she was not given this order of protection. Time she did testify against Josh at his trial. She was actually the last witness for the state and did help in verifying that he had been a predator for a very, very long time. Jim and Bobby smile and say they have two kids. And then they laugh and say they have 11. Jim Holt says the IBLP teaches the more children you have, the more blessed by God you are. Jim is a former Arkansas state senator, and Bobby was the one that Josh confessed to molesting his sisters to back in 2003, saying it started in the time frame of when he was 12. They said Jim Bob said the reason they were told about the molestation was because Josh was dating their daughter at the time. The assaults happened, and Josh had cheated on their daughter. They said Jim Bob and Michelle were very panicked and distraught the night this was revealed to them. And Jim said he was too, and he went out into a field and cried. You should have gotten your car and taken yourself to the police station there, buddy. Our next partner is Athletic Greens. I take AG1 by Athletic Greens literally every day. And I gave it a try because I wanted better gut health, more energy, immune system support, and I hate taking pills and vitamins. I wanted a supplement that was easy. And I've always struggled with what to buy. I ended up taking eight different supplements every morning at one point, and it was just too much. AG1 is super easy. It's one scoop of powder mixed with water once a day. That's it. AG1 has become part of my morning routine. And get this, it's packed with 75 different vitamins and minerals. On top of boosting my gut health and having more energy, my hair, skin, and my nails all look healthier. I also like the immune system support it provides since I'm on crowded planes and airports and courtrooms with a lot of people on a regular basis. If you're looking for an easier way to take supplements, Athletic Greens is giving you a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs, which are super handy when you're traveling with your first purchase. Go to athleticgreens.com slash what the world. That's athleticgreens.com slash what the world. Check it out. Bobby said that one night when Josh was babysitting his sisters, he called their house and said he was feeling tempted. Bobby said that night he molested his sister who was five at the time. Josh was 15 and the abuse had been going on for three years at this point. Again, didn't report anything at all. She said he previously had been for, forbidden from babysitting, but apparently Jip Bob and, and Michelle thought that he was better and let him babysit again. Not long after that, Jim Bob and Michelle told Bobby and Jim that they needed steps taken to prevent further abuse. So Josh was sent away to what the Holtz thought was a treatment facility, but Josh was checked out for Jim Bob's birthday, and they thought it was odd that he could just be signed out if he's in a treatment facility. They find out Jim Bob and Michelle didn't tell the police about Josh's abuse, but sent him to a basic life principles facility. More was told to them by the Duggars, and what we know is just the tip of the iceberg. Not long after that scandal hit, Josh was in the middle of the other one being exposed as somebody who paid to cheat on his wife. Then we have the charges that he faced and is currently incarcerated for. It all unraveled, but it really should have unraveled way earlier. You know, I'm all for people who homeschool the right way. Look, COVID taught me I could not homeschool my kids again, would not want to go down that path. But in this cult, Homeschooling is how they ingrain the beliefs of the IBLP into kids' brains from such a very early age. And the goal was to push the homeschool kids into positions of influence within government and areas of influence to eventually kind of refashion America. Chad Harris was a person in the documentary. He said world domination was the goal. He also said that he has given up everything to do this documentary. In other words, by speaking out, that was sort of the end from what I gathered of him and his family. Josh was working on the political group, the Family Research Council, which is an American evangelical activist group, which is affiliated with lobbying organizations there in Washington. It promotes what it considers to be family values. It opposes and lobbies against access to pornography, embryonic stem cell research, abortion, divorce, and LGBTQ rights. Jill is the fourth oldest 
And she said it's her story and she would rather be the one telling it as opposed to tabloids who make up whatever they want. Jim Bob and Michelle first met when Jim Bob was out on church visitation. Jim Bob's friend mentions Michelle, who was a cheerleader in a very short skirt. I might add, clearly she wasn't raised with this very strict, oppressive, patriarchal environment. She had just recently become a Christian. Michelle was the youngest of seven, and she said she wasn't like Jim Bob. She had dated, and she said she got mixed up in that whole girlfriend-boyfriend mess. You know what the rest of us call learning lessons about love before you settle down with the person you're meant to be with. He invited her to his junior-senior banquet, and Michelle said they talked for four hours about all things God. He opened up the word of God and explained things to her that she had never heard. And that night she got on her knees and gave her life to God. She was 17 at the time and he was 19. They got married and she was on birth control and then got pregnant with Josh. She went back on the pill after his birth and then got pregnant anyways and miscarried. They show a clip of her really tearfully explaining that they got on their knees before God and asked for his forgiveness for taking birth control. And right after that, God bless them with twins. Jim Bob said that that area of their life was given to God and he just kept blessing us with more kids and he makes a joke and more kids and more kids and the crowd's all, oh, that's so funny. Jill said that Michelle and Jim Bob believe you should have as many kids as you could until your body tells you to stop. Their last pregnancy, which would have been their 20th child, ended in uh, just a failure to thrive for the embryo. There was no heartbeat detected. And that was the last time she was pregnant, as far as I know. Last child that was born was a preemie due to high blood pressure. And so clearly her body was telling her um, it was enough. It's very physically demanding to be pregnant. I had three, two back to back, kind of, just a couple of years, less than two years apart. I, it's like this woman was pregnant every year and it wreaks havoc on your body. And it's, these women are just baby making machines and at the beck and call of their husbands. She said grandparents on, Jill said that grandparents on both sides of their family disagreed with their decision to have so many children. And then they, they show a clip of Jim Bob's parents being introduced to the newest grandkid. And the dad was just stoic. He, it, it was like, oh my gosh, here's my new grandchild. It's just like, Another one, you know, so it's not like they were all raised this way. They became members of a cult. Jill said her dad was working three jobs. He worked at a convenience store. He had a car business and a tow truck service. And she said they would find all the kids eat free places and stay there for hours. Can you imagine seeing that family come in the door on kids eat free night? Jim Bob has one sister, Deanna, and she's the mom of cousin Amy. Amy was raised the total opposite of the Duggars away from the cult and Deanna said she and Jim Bob were close growing up and they were raised missionary Baptist, which is very conservative. They couldn't go to dances. She wasn't allowed to wear blue jeans and she wasn't allowed to be a cheerleader. Those things inspired her to do the opposite when her daughter was born and raise her differently and to allow her to have the freedoms to make choices in her life about what she wanted to do. I love the clip from the TLC show they show when they ask, off camera to Amy, do you plan on having this many kids? And she's like, uh, that's a no. She says, in spite of being raised completely different from her cousins, she was over at Jim Bob and Michelle's pretty much every day and every aspect of her cousins lives were completely different from hers. She didn't know what they were being taught, just that they were being homeschooled. The household was super strict, according to Amy, no radio, no TV. And in fact, if they had a tornado warning, which is a frequent thing in Arkansas, sometimes they would have to go tell them we have a, we have a tornado warning because they had no way to find out. So she goes on to explain some of what goes on behind the scenes of filming a reality show. And it's not really reality. As we know, you may have to walk through a door 20 times to get the right shot or if you did your sit down interview and you missed something or needed to redo something, you would have to redress on a different day to match exactly how you looked the day you gave that first interview. They show one of the Duggar kids talk about cousin Amy and he says, Amy's not the same way as us, but we still like her. I bet to them she was kind of like a wow thing where this is a member of your family. This is your first cousin and she's getting the opposite experience of what you're getting and being a child. I wonder if that was ever a source of the kids looking at Amy and wishing they had the freedoms that she had. They wear 
pantaloons under their dress. So it's not like shorts. This is like if you were to jump off of something and hold this, it would probably parachute you down. They also were forbidden from wearing pants and shorts and they could not show, show their shoulders. They show a clip of Amy being baptized by Jim Bob and she said she admired him when she was younger and he was really a father figure to her. She thought there wasn't anything he couldn't do. She thought he could be president one day if he wanted. This is when she's a kid and kind of oblivious to what's really happening in this house. They cut to a clip of Jim Bob talking about how he got into politics. He said there was a pro-life march and they were trying to outlaw partial birth abortion and the politicians did not pass the ban. And that moved him to get involved in politics. So they toured the Capitol and met Mike Huckabee. He said he was scared, but he ran and the Lord put him in there. They moved to Little Rock while he served his time, and Josh loved being there with Jim. They nicknamed him Little Governor, and he went with Jim Bob a lot because he was the oldest child. Jill talks about a club that Josh formed with some other friends of his called Boycott, which stands for Boys Christian Outreach Team, and their purpose was to boycott a local convenience store very close to their house because she couldn't remember if that store had began to sell alcohol or pornography, but they formed this little club and they were going to boycott them. Jim Bob ran again. He ultimately served two times, serving four years in the state house of representatives. And in 2002, he decided to run for the U S Senate. He lost, but it opened another door. A photo taken of Jim Bob, Michelle and all their little line of kids coming out of the voting place sparked parents magazine to feature the Duggars in their magazine, which in turn got the attention of discovery health. So Discovery Health gets in touch with Jim Bob and Michelle. Probably just Jim Bob. At that time, Discovery was really a medical channel. They would show surgeries and kind of out there procedures. And they wanted to do a one-hour documentary on the Duggar family. Jim Bob thought, of course, this is a way to introduce his values to the country and also to get rich. He said that it was a way to tell the world that children were a gift from God and that they would do the documentary only if they didn't edit out their faith. At that time, they had 14 kids and they were pregnant again. It shows the Holtz family greeting them in this big ice skating rink. Jim and Bobby, it goes back to them. He said he met Bobby when he was 19 and she was 14. Okay, big red flag. Later on down the road, not so much, but big difference between 19 and 14. He said she did, he did not know this. I'm going to call BS on that one. His cousin said she was 17 or 18. Jim Bob told him they needed friends at the ice skating rink to interview for this one-hour documentary, and he said he regrets going now. It shows videos of the two families having religious studies in a home, and Josh and their first kid were born just a few days apart. They showed Josh sitting down to do a selfie video, and he says, I may not be a household name, but you might have heard of my family. Oh, just wait there, Josh. We're all going to know your name soon enough, unfortunately. Well, of course, that one-hour documentary did really well, and they did a Christmas special where Jill said it was really weird because they had to pretend to have Christmas. Then they did five more specials on them over the course of some time. It shows their first house, which had two bathrooms and was 2,400 square feet, and then the new house, which was 7,000 square feet. Jill was a teenager when they moved. The show arranged to have that house finished for the Duggars, which essentially was TLC investing in a set for their reality show. Jim Holt said he believes that the amount needed to complete that house was around two hundred to three hundred thousand dollars. In two thousand eight, the reality show Seventeen Kids and Counting started, and as we know, it got popular really fast. Cousin Amy said that people were mesmerized of how you have that many kids in a clean house or you have everything color-coded and just organization is key, obviously, to running a house like they do. They show footage of where it says Jessa was in charge of the laundry, which was 10 loads a day. There was no drama. The kids were not allowed to argue and the parents were peaceful. So that was sort of the mesmerizing part of this series, I think, in the beginning that people thought... I have three kids. My gosh, it's it's kind of like we're battling a poltergeist in my house most days. And then you've got 17 kids lined up, smiling, being quiet, getting along, not poking each other. But with that, to get to that point comes physical abuse. Jill said they went to the TLC headquarters and there was a picture of all the Duggars that was photoshopped on this very, very long tandem bike. And it was that moment where she realized this show is a really big deal. Remember, they didn't have TV 
So they didn't know the feedback on it, weren't allowed on the internet, things like that. So that was a big revelation for her. They show a clip where Michelle is being interviewed and she's asked if the show is reinforcing gender stereotypes. And she said, I think there are some gender aspects you can't get around. And that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. Danielle Lindemann is an author who wrote a book on reality TV. And she said the cash cows of the series were the wedding and the birth episodes. Remember, pretty much every Duggar has gotten married on TV and they've had a camera in the birthing room when the children have gone on to have children of their own. And of course, the kids were all getting married one after the other. So there was plenty of that footage to go around. She talks about how TLC went from the learning channel to kind of a peek into the unusual. You have sister wives, which is polygamy. You have 90 Day Fiance, where people are doing the exact opposite of courting. You know, these are all shows we watch out of morbid curiosity, I think. It's just a very different way of life for most of us. And it became a huge hit for TLC. And they actually went on to buy Warner Brothers, which is not cheap. So the Duggars were a cash cow that brought this network in a ton of money. But at the same time, it also furthered Bill Gothard's teachings and also enabled cover-ups and everything else we've talked about. TLC added more shows featuring families who are fundamentalists. And they show a clip of the Duggars on a talk show in 2012. And the host says, Michelle... I'm almost a little afraid to ask. I understand you have a big announcement this morning. And Michelle says, we're expecting our 20th child and we're just thrilled. And you cut to the kids and they're all just sitting around like, what? They show Michelle in season six where she's told that baby has no heartbeat. Jim Bob said that both of their hearts just sank and they were devastated. Cousin Amy said with the show and the babies, they became the poster child for the IBLP on their platform. Michelle is giving a speech and she said, if you have not gone through the basic seminar, she highly recommends it. And so there is a woman named Jennifer who hosts a YouTube channel. I haven't watched it yet, but it looks really interesting. She talks about the Duggars while she does her makeup. That's really cool. Jim Bob is seen giving a speech saying that God has opened up a lot of ministry opportunities for their family. And Michelle said it's not a show. It's really not. It's our life. It really is. You lie, woman. That was not your real life. Jennifer said that the Christian fundamentalists were largely underground with their own schools, their own entertainment, and no reason to interact with the outside world. Everything very insular. It shows clips as the show gains tractions, and you see that at the peak of its popularity, they're selling out these book signings. The book store said they've never had that kind of a crowd. They're getting stopped for pictures. They're going to Japan, that kind of thing. Then they start focusing the episode on Josh, and it shows a montage of clips from the first documentary up to the point where he got married. And it shows Josh and Anna on a talk show doing a gender reveal with a cake where they reveal on the morning show that their first child's going to be a girl. Then they show a clip from the show where Josh and Anna announce they're going to take a job in Washington, D.C. And there's a clip of Josh singing this patriotic song in front of a bus with all the kids lying down. And I think it's Jill who's having to stand right behind him with him arm's reach and play a violin as he very poorly sings a patriotic song, I might add. Josh had accepted a job with the Family Research Council, which is conservative lobbying, and it's just a Christian worldview is the goal, essentially. Jim Bob's sister said she was glad they were getting their own show, but at the same time, she didn't know what was going on behind closed doors. So they go into the scandal of when the news hit about Josh molesting his sisters. That news went public on May 19th, 2015. Way back when, Oprah Winfrey's team, Harpo, her production company, had called the child abuse hotline after being tipped off about the abuse in the home. This was back in 2006, by the way, but In Touch Weekly had gotten their hands on the nearly 10-year-old police report, and it says that when Josh was 14 to 15, he forcibly touched five girls between 2002 and 2003, and some of those victims were his sisters. They asked Jill if she remembers when Josh was sent away, but she doesn't want to talk about it. Uh, Derek says they wish nobody had ever found out about this, the molestation. And Jill agrees and says it's very hard for her. Derek said that Jill confided in him after they were married, and they hoped that that would remain private until they all died because nobody needed to find out. And Jill just has tears flowing down her face. And Derek says this is something that is very heavily guarded with them. 
And Jill said nobody should have ever known about it. And she doesn't like talking about it. And that's completely understandable. Just the trauma of what happened to her is bad enough. But the fact that you're forced to cohabitate with your attacker, forced to put on a smile in front of the cameras, is so twisted in so many ways. And couple that with the biggest point, nobody was held accountable and they never got the help they needed. Jim and Bobby are asked when they found out about Josh and Jim puts his face kind of in his hands and says, how deep do we go? Because this is a big rabbit hole. He said, it's really twisted. Bobby said they knew Josh since he was a baby and he was their daughter's boyfriend. And Jim said, Josh asked if he could court their daughter for the purpose of marriage. And they said, yes. And look, I'm not a math wizard, but that would put Josh at like 15 or 16 asking the first girl ever out to court for the purpose of marriage. They show a clip from the first documentary, I assume, where Josh says, I think if you're going to give your heart away, you need to be giving it to someone who's going to love you and care about you and not someone who's simply going to get carried away with their emotions. Jim Bob said they found out on March 30th of 2003, Josh was 15 at the time, Jim Bob said to Jim that Josh had gotten into some trouble and he's touched his sisters inappropriately. At one point, Bobby said Josh molested his sisters and Michelle said to her, don't say that again. Jim asked, when were you going to tell us? And Michelle said, we weren't going to have them tell you guys at all. We were going to have Josh confess to your daughter once they were married. Jim asked Jim Bob if they were using their daughter sort of as bait to try and change Josh's behavior. And Jim Bob says, well, yeah, kind of. Jim says that Jim Bob, ironically, had written a bill that created a sex offender website. And Jim says to Jim Bob, according to your own bill that you've written and from what you've told me, your son should be on that website. Jim said Josh violated the law and they needed to make it right with the law and turn himself in. Jim Bob said he was about to take Josh and asked if Jim wanted to accompany him. So Jim says yes. They met at the state trooper's office. Jim said Josh told the trooper what they thought was everything he had done. And I think what they thought was everything he had done was a big clue that it went way worse than the already terrible things we know about what happened. The trooper said he would let Josh go, but if he ever did it again, he's going to come down hard on him. The trooper, friend of Jim Bob's, Bobby said that Jim Bob was thinking about his options as far as getting Josh out of the house and ended up taking him to Bill Gothard's facility in Little Rock, Arkansas, which was an IBLP facility for troubled youth. They're showing clips of boys doing carpentry and like cement work. And Amy was wondering where Josh was. She was told he was helping families build homes at a camp because he's a good guy like that she kind of felt something was off. While Josh was gone, that's when Jim Bob and Michelle were going to do that interview with Parent Magazine. That would eventually become the gateway to the TLC show. Jim asked Jim Bob, what were they going to tell the magazine about Josh? And Jim Bob said, they're going to tell them that Josh is in Little Rock ministering. But Josh was signed out of the facility and brought back. Jim Bob said he wanted Josh there for his birthday, meaning Jim Bob's. He told Jim Bob, I don't care if you're the best Christian family ever, but in 20 years, when people find out about this, they're going to eat you alive. They show Tara and Floyd on screen. They're adorable. Tara says this isn't the first time she's heard of molestation happening in the IBLP, and Bill Gothard had accusations against him as well. Both of these individuals, Tara and Floyd, were raised in this kind of a household and found each other and seem really, really happy. Chad Harris says too much of the focus has been on the Duggars and not the institution itself. And they show a clip of mothers holding babies and Gothard says, we're all proud of these mothers and fathers who obeyed the Lord in bringing more sons and daughters into the world. Tara says people look at Josh and see a monster. And then she says monsters are created. They talk about homeschooling and Jim Bob says that they teach their kids that evolution is unscientific. And that ended that first episode. It is so much to unpack and to hear from former members of this cult, as well as people who are very knowledgeable about these principles and practices. It is so eye-opening that this is such a big deal in these communities and it's being swept under the rug and dealt with on a spiritual level and not a real world level, a here and now, let's prevent future abuse level. And it's 
it's a big cult, y'all. There are a lot of people that follow this movement who I'm sure probably will follow this movement until they're not here anymore because that's how deep they are into it. And when you use fear as a tactic in religion, it can be very effective when it is instilled on you from the time you're an infant. I think that's 100% what this is. It's also a power trip by Bill Gothard to tell people how to live their lives in areas he has no experience in, such as being a husband or being a father. But yet everybody trusted him to tell them how to raise their kids, even demonstrating on stage, by the way, how to properly spank a child. Gross stuff. But man, these survivors of this cult, the survivors of the abuse that happens inside this cult, so brave in telling this story and giving us a glimpse into this group of people who are harboring predators and protecting predators. And not only that, shaming the victims of these attacks and not getting them the professional help they need to work through unimaginable things being done at the hands of siblings and adults alike. So the next episode, we're going to finish this up, not diving into the actual details of the molestation. Uh, there's not a whole lot to talk about, but I do want to finish it up. What are Jim, Bob, and Michelle really thinking right now? I mean, their dirty laundry has been aired partially by one of their own kids that did the opposite of what Bill Gothard said would happen if you raise them under his word, went astray, or actually found out she has a voice and she knows her worth and is dealing with these things on a real world level. So hats off to Jill and Derek. I know for Derek, he's probably been a constant support for her. And she's a beautiful young woman. And I hope that she at least comes to a point in her life where she can understand that this was never her fault. It was set up to fail her and her siblings and the babysitter. It was never about their rights or their needs or their their place in that family. It was about protecting the male in that family being Josh. And what a disservice to these children that Jim, Bob, and Michelle say are gifts from God. That so much that they had 19 of them. All right, guys, we'll see you tomorrow to finish this up. Then Saturday, I'm probably going to do some updates on Koberger. Harmony Montgomery's dad was just found guilty on all the weapons charges he was at trial for. I want to update on the Parkland School Resource Officer trial that's going on right now. Lots of stuff that we need to tackle and get up to speed on. So I hope you guys have a good rest of your day. We'll see you tomorrow. Mm -hmm.